Greetings, Crusaders, and welcome to Couch Warrior TV on YouTube. I'm the Couch Warrior, and you're watching a Character Crusade content feature. Today, we're actually going to be taking a look at the Emperor's Anvil. If you remember episode 7 of the podcast, uh, I believe it was, I went into some detail about how I was using a mod called Tundra Defense to actually create uh, kind of a Legion outpost out in the middle of nowhere. At that time, I said that I was going to try to record some kind of a tour and give folks not only uh, an idea of how the mod works, but how specifically I'm using it. Now, my use of Tundra Defense uh, goes along with the story of my Red Guard warrior character, Shulat. We've discussed him on the podcast as well, and we're looking at him right now. He's sitting at his favorite table in the Bannered Mare. We've kind of discussed Shulat as part of the podcast, being a bit antisocial, a bit uncomfortable in social situations, I guess, more at home on the battlefield than he is, uh, you know, in the civilized world, as it were. So when he comes to the Bannered Mare, he tends to sit back here in the corner. Now, of course, what we do know of this character is that he also is a little bit sweet on Sadia and finds that she comes back here to the kitchen to cook where he can observe her. When he sits down, she'll come back and ask him if he wants something to eat or drink. Uh, you know, he's, he's a little bit of a lovesick individual who doesn't know how to approach her. There she is right there. So... Rather than doing anything about it, he looks on. <laughs> now, maybe someday he'll actually uh, take some action on those feelings. But uh, for now, what we're going to do is have Shulat take us on a little bit of a tour of, of what we have created using Tundra Defense. As I'd mentioned on the podcast, I've, I've dubbed this outpost the Emperor's Anvil. And as I'm using it in story, uh, Shulat has basically taken control of a local group of Legion soldiers, and they have set up an outpost kind of out in the wilderness to sort of serve as a lightning rod for all the bandits that seem to be prevalent in this area so that rather than attacking the civilians, they will focus on the anvil. And so his intent is to really draw the attention of not only um, the Stormcloaks, but also the bandits who are operating locally. And kind of use this as a way to ingratiate himself with um, the citizens and the government of Whiterun, since according to the story, Whiterun is really still in play. They haven't... Uh, come down on one side or the other in the Civil War storyline yet. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. So Shulat is really doing his best to kind of help people out. Let's take a look at him first of all. At this point he is a level 27 uh, warrior. He's, he's really focused on being a warrior almost exclusively and I've really kind of um, tried to play him as though he were a soldier living in a soldier's world. So, as you'll see later on when we actually get a tour uh, of, the, um, of the outposts that he's created, I'm, I'm really focusing on trying to define for myself the Legion way of life, um, the soldier's culture. And Shulat is the commanding officer of the outpost that I've created. So what I've done here is you may notice this armor looks a little bit different. I've taken the heroic legionnaire's armor and I've modified uh, for myself the textures. So I've actually um, redone the textures so that we're, we're kind of sporting a darker look, um, kind of a black, glossy and gold look. I've made some enhancements to the red, so it's sort of a deeper, richer red. And then the other thing that I've done is just added a few accessories. One of the questions that I've gotten on the website is, you know, how, how are you able to have multiple swords and stuff? Well, I'm kind of doing this for show. I mean, he's really, he, he's a, he's a, a two-handed um, weapon wielder, but what I've done here is I've got his, his two-handed 
steel sword. It's a Dai Katana um, on his back. And then I'm also uh, using a mod. Um, this, basically, I'm using the X... Oh, what is it? XP32 skeleton. And I've configured that skeleton so that one-handed weapons will also be worn on the back. So by carrying both a two-handed weapon and a one-handed weapon, they're both displaying there kind of alternately. It sort of has um, a similar to look to what you might see with um, the Witcher, for example, having a, a dual sword kind of setup. Now, granted, because I'm a two-handed uh, weapon specialist, I rarely use that one-handed weapon. It's, it's more there for visual effect than anything else, but I like how it looks. And then the way that I'm getting all the weapons to display here is I'm using the equipping overhaul, which allows me to display all the weapons that I favorite. So I have favorited the one-handed katana, the two-handed dai katana, and then I've also favorited the wakazashi and used the XP32 skeleton to position that um, on his lower back. So all daggers that he carries will be positioned on his lower back. Now, one of the things that is an issue, obviously, when you're doing this kind of thing, some, some weapons are better than others, but um, there, there's always an issue from time to time with uh, certain weapons not displaying properly on the body. I find your hand in my these, I find, are really excellent. Now, these weapons are coming from the Immersive Weapons Pack, which I highly recommend. You can see they really look like they're they're mounted in the right place on his back. And the two-handed die katana actually comes with that strap that, that seems to be kind of riding over his shoulder. What I find is that when the two are sort of pushed together like that, it really looks like he's got some kind of a rig um, attached that, that holds both swords. But one thing, obviously, that, that we can do in instances where it doesn't work well is we can cover it with something like this backpack. Now, I needed the extra carry capacity anyway, so pairing up kind of a nice black backpack with this armor set just made sense. But just in terms of having a nice, clean look to the way his, his weapons are mounted in relationship to the armor, I didn't necessarily need it with these weapon choices. So you can kind of... Um, cover up some flaws and weirdness just by picking the right equipment and and not having you know forcing yourself to go in and start modifying skeletons and weapon placement in creation kit to try to fix those problems yourself now the the other thing that um, you could do as well is you know the second you throw on a big cloak like this you're taking care of a lot of those issues too. You're sort of disguising them. So if you're a person like me who cares about how that stuff looks, there are a number of different ways that you can get around it. But the particular weapons that I've chosen for Shulat seem to work well without any of these cover-ups and workarounds. So there he is. Now in battle, we're also sporting the full-faced helm with the comb. I've obviously modified the texture here too. And I really like the way it looks. One thing you may notice, it's a little bit difficult to see, but around his neck, he's also wearing um, kind of a black scarf that hangs down um, kind of the right side of his chest. That scarf comes from a mod um, called Journeyman Armor, and it's got a bunch of kind of cool accessories built into it, you know, things like, um, you know, scarves and... Um, you know, interesting, um, interesting extras like that. And with this particular character, um, obviously I want him to be the quintessential Legion soldier, but we also understand that soldiers that constitute the Legion army come from all parts of Tamriel. So I wanted to include something in his look that sort of spoke to who he was as a person. So I thought, you know what, maybe his thing is that, um, you know, he, he uses the scarf um, for a while. I was using kind of a fur collar for a while that went actually very nicely with this armor. Um, the scarf, I thought, was just kind of a nice, unique addition that sort of felt like I was putting a little bit of ethnic flavor into um, the Legion armor. All right. So... We're going to head out here. 
Oh, of course, it's raining. Well, we'll put on our cloak. Oh, here it is, right here. They call it they call it a muffler. Here, I have one called Autumn and one called Black. He's wearing the black one right now. I found the Autumn one is is kind of the right shade of red that it actually goes well with the uniform as well, as well. So that that's not a bad look either. But for right now, I'm sticking with the black one. Now there are versions of the muffler that don't include the the portion that actually hangs down your chest. Those are nice looking as well, but I just kind of like that that sort of feature, that look. So here's a little bit of the weapon setup. Um, I have acquired the Dawnbreaker. I don't use it. Obviously, I'm a two-handed weapon specialist, but I'm using the Steel Nodachi, and uh, I carry also the Steel Tanto and the Wakazashi. All steel, all kind of in the same family. You'll notice these are all war forged. That is an indication that I am using Percus Maximus. So Percus Maximus is a, is a kind of a mainstay for me now. I don't play without it. So, well, <clears throat> this rain is kind of sucking. It's going to be hard because of the EMB I'm using. It's, it's a fairly realistic lighting mod. Um, it's called Sky Realism and when the cloud cover comes and the rain starts, it becomes very difficult to make out details. So <clears throat> let's see what we can do here. I may... Let's try pushing the time frame forward a little bit. See if we can get the rain to stop so that we can get a better look at things. Yeah, we might be a little bit screwed here. So we'll add 12 hours on. Oh, let me get another one of those. What I'm really looking for is just some good sort of morning or afternoon daylight, um, bright sunlight, uh, so you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. While I'm working on this, let's, <clears throat> let's talk a bit, a bit about um, Tundra Defense. There, that's not too bad. What time is it? It's about 8 o'clock. Let's, let's talk about Tundra Defense a little bit. Um, Tundra Defense we've talked about in the podcast. I think if you go back and listen to uh, Episode 6, Episode 7, Tundra Defense is mentioned. Um, it, it's the mod that I'm using to create my outpost. And I know that uh, Joe is currently using it in one of his playthroughs and he's done some really kind of interesting things with it. But what Tundra Defense allows you to do is it gives you a toolkit that makes it possible for you to build outposts and settlements and things anywhere you want to. Now it, it has a mechanic built into it that allows you to kick off raids so that your outpost will be attacked. But whether or not you do that is purely optional. Even if you just decide to use it as a construction kit, it's, it's pretty amazing in, in that capacity alone. So what I've done is I've used Tundra Defense as, as a mean to, means to tell my story here, which is that he has um, taken command um, of the Legion troops in this area, and they've built this outpost, as I said before, to kind of be a lightning rod for bandits and, you know, storm cloaks and, generally speaking, folks who might be causing problems in the area. Um, the idea is to try to get on the good side of the local government and influence, um, influence their opinions of the Imperial Army in this area. Okay, so... That is Fort Graymore. So just so you understand kind of what we're, what we're talking about here in terms of area, um, Fort Graymore is here. If you know where Dustman's Cairn is, Dustman's Cairn is one of the first places that you will go to as part of uh, the Companion's quest line. Uh, my outpost is here. You can see it, it, puts, in a, it puts in a marker here so that you can find it. But 
uh, wherever you decide to build. That's, that's the beauty of tundra defense. You can literally build anywhere that you want. You find an open piece of land and start building. The real challenge comes in when um, trying to build in ways that actually make sense. So from a strategic perspective, you'd want to build a high point at a high point where you can kind of see the surrounding countryside. So that's what I've attempted to do here. The tools that are provided, it, it's, it's much easier to build in a flat spot. It's much more of a challenge to build in, in an area that has um, a lot of interesting land features. And that's, that's the challenge that I decided to, to accept here. I wanted to try to build some place that made sense strategically. So that's what I did. Now here we're coming up on the, um, the outpost itself. Now, this road leads up the hill to Dustman's Cairn. Um, it goes around the corner there to, uh, what was it called? Hadvar's Rest or something like that? What is it? Hamvir's Rest, which is basically a cemetery. So what I've done is I've used the, the tools provided in Tundra Defense. I've created a little shelter here for the soldiers who are actually um, working this checkpoint. And then um, these barriers I have set up as, as part of their checkpoint. Tundra Defense provides those. And you can see I've got a couple of stationary guards here who are manning the checkpoint itself, and then I have some patrolling guards as well. Now, what, what I think is really great about Tundra Defense is it allows you to set up patrol routes, so you can see these poles. Um, when you start Tundra Defense, you'll have eight of these markers that you can deploy. Four of them are designed to be deployed as um, perimeter patrol areas. And wherever you set up these markers, the, um, the soldiers that are part of your patrol group will actually march in between those markers. So I've got four markers that are set up in a patrol route outside em the Emperor's Anvil and then I've got four markers that are set up inside. So I've got some interior and exterior patrols going on. So you can see marker number one is down by the checkpoint. Now these, these markers don't come with the torches on them. Um, I put the torches on them myself and that is also something that you can do in Tundra Defense. Okay. So that was marker number two. Here's marker number three. You can see here's Dustman's Cairn. And then if we continue on towards the mountain chain, here's, here's marker number four. So what's going to happen is um, my patrols, they're just going to kind of march a circuit going from one marker to the next, which takes them basically up and down this hillside. There you have it. So let's take a look at the anvil. You can see there's a, I liked this spot because there's kind of a natural formation here, this big rock that juts out. And from the top of that rock, you're able to see um, Fort Graymore. You're able to see the Western Watchtower. You're able to see Dragon's Reach. And you can even see, um, you can see uh, off to the east, you can see Silent Moon's camp. So the entrance I have placed up here at the top of the hill. Now I have a defensive position here. And then before you reach the gate, I've got another defensive position here. So in each one of these positions, I've got you know a couple of stationary guards. Um, stationary basically means that, that they, they guard that spot, but if you know, your fortifications are attacked, they'll move from that spot and engage the enemy, and then once the fight is over, they will come back to their spot. So let's go on inside. And this is where we enter the Emperor's Anvil. All right. So here is one of the markers for my interior patrol. 
And you can see we've got a guard coming up right now. Again, I've got four of these markers. Now, I'm at a fairly advanced stage in the creation of this thing. Um, the, the, basically, the way that it works is when you first start the mod, you are able to um, position a well. And that well serves as the central point of your fortification. So if we go down here, you'll see my well right here. And this, the location of this well basically, it just represents the center of my fortification. And then once I've placed this well, I can click on the well itself and it starts to activate different features. So then I can um, start to deploy different things. One of the first things that you deploy is this kind of office building. Essentially, this, this is sort of um, the headquarters, if you will. It's small, but it does have a place to store things. It's got safe storage. It's got a place to rest, a little bit of warmth. But the important thing here um, is the desk. This is outpost management. And from here, I can create raids. I can bind keys. I can view controls. Um, I can look at how many raids um, I've had, uh, the number of, of guards that I've got on duty or that have been killed, um, the number of scavengers or citizens that, that live here. Um, you can control a lot from that space. Let's head back out. Hello. That's a stationary guard I was talking about. So essentially... You slap down, you know, your well, and then you lay out your markers. And so I laid out my perimeter markers outside. I've got my interior markers. Here's another one here. So if we take a look at this, the guards inside are going to patrol between these markers. So they're going to hit this marker. They're going to go hit this one. And then watch how they proceed. Yes. They're going to come around this wall here. They pass this marker up through here. And then I kind of guide them along up over this space down to this marker. And then they start their circuit again. And that's essentially what they're doing. So, yes. this guy here, we take a look at him. He's the one who actually sells all the supplies that are required for me to build things. Now, I'm, I'm focusing on creating kind of what, what I think of as a classic, um, you know, um, Roman wilderness fortification. So, I'm using a lot of these wooden pieces. I'm, I'm creating palisades and stuff like that. Um, so I've kind of stuck with that as a motif. But you can see the challenges here associated with this land feature. So it's, if we zoom back a little bit, there's kind of a lot going on here. Um, and it's, it's much less complicated when you're building on a flat space. You don't have to worry about clipping and overlapping and crazy stuff going on. But um, it's totally worth it. Um, it's it's much more believable that, that they would build in a high spot like this. So here's really um, the peak of this rock formation. And you can see from this spot, my stationary guard here, he's, you know, he's able to see all up and down this road, all the way to that point at Fort Graymore where it intersects with the main road to Whiterun. We can see the Western Watchtower we can see Dragon's Reach. Um, we look over here. We can see uh, Silent Moon's camp. And we can look back on the anvil here. Um, one of the things I did is I put in a rug here. And Shulat comes up here every morning at sunrise and he prays. Um, set up a fire up here, kind of a, a watch fire. You can see that for quite a ways off. So it's a little easier to pinpoint the fortification when it's dark or when the weather's bad. Okay, and then I created some scaffolds up here where these guys can kind of get a look at what's going on.
in this area of the fortification. So basically, each one of these pieces um, I buy individually from that guy over here, over there, and then I deploy them. The Palisades themselves, you know, you buy that once, and then you use it as many times as you need to uh, to build your wall. The surface that I'm on right now is just, it's basically a giant wooden platform. And so what I did is I built two wooden platforms to give me some flat space upon which I could build things. So if we take a look here, you can see this big wood platform. And then on top of it, I was able to actually construct a watchtower. We've got some sleeping areas in here for individuals who, who work this area. And then I've got stationary guards placed up here. I've also put a couple of items up here for my own use, just because it was convenient and it was a sheltered spot. You can see the palisade extends all the way around here, up the hill, and it gives really a, a nice commanding view of the entire valley area here. So let's head back down. Okay, I've got another watchtower here. And then this space over here, I've kind of set it up as if it were kind of a break area. So we've got a table. Um, we've actually got uh, drinking water. And um, individuals who live in the space will actually come over here and use these chairs. They'll come over and they'll get water or mead from the mead barrel. Now right now I'm walking on top of the barracks. Another thing that I had to build here were barracks for my soldiers to live in. The barracks is also the location where you actually um, control your soldiers, where you deploy new soldiers. Let's go take a look at the controls here. Again, this is another feature that you, you set up. That bush is kind of a problem, but whatever. So if I activate the barracks, you can see here now I can purchase perimeter guards, stationary guards, or patrol guards. And then I can also buy upgrades. So um, the medic tent is kind of nice. Um, you set that up, and when the medic tent is, is deployed, when you've got that deployed, um, your soldiers will slowly regenerate health. So it doesn't happen instantly. They slowly regenerate. So if you have soldiers that... Uh, survive a battle um, but are injured, over time they'll regenerate their health points. And as another point worth mentioning is these soldiers are not indestructible. They will die when the bandits come. Uh, the armory upgrade, um, what the armory upgrade allowed me to do was actually configure a chest, and we'll go and see that. I've kind of hidden that away. Obviously all of my soldiers are Imperial soldiers. Oh, here's the Medi tent, by the way. Medical tent. And so I wanted to put them all in Imperial armor. So this chest here, um, let's see, view chest inventory. So basically any, any equipment that I drop into this chest will be um, distributed automatically to any new soldiers I create, whether they're patrolling, uh, perimeter, or stationary. So I can, I can drop the armor I need them to wear in here once, and then they will all use it. Now it doesn't automatically apply to soldiers that have already been deployed, but one of the things I can do is I can select a soldier, make a slight modification in, in that soldier's setup, and they will essentially re-render in the world, and when they re-render, they'll come back in with all the necessary gear. So this I set up, this is kind of where all the food is prepared. Presumably, it's served here. And then uh, the last thing that I'll point out is right here, um, I was able to construct what's essentially a general store. I can come in here and sell any of the loot that we acquire um, after taking on bandits. So if I start a bandit raid, um, they are, they're going to attack, but they'll all have gear. I can go around after the battle's over. I can gather up their gear and sell it to this guy and turn it into cash, which I can use to upgrade portions of the fortress. Um, so 
that's essentially what's going on here. Now there's more stuff that I can build that I just haven't yet. And I think um, in addition to a general store, eventually, you know, you have the ability to um, build a mine. Um, I've thought about that, and I think, you know, the mine would have to go back in here somewhere. You're able to also um, have citizens live here who would pay taxes. And then as you advance through Tundra Defense, you will periodically receive letters. You'll go back to the well, and there'll be a letter there from somebody in Skyrim who's either offering services or is offering to sell you something. One such letter came from a blacksmith who was interested in setting up inside here. So I went and tracked her down, uh, took her up on her offer, and then I was able to acquire all these new features to set up inside here. Um, and then she will work this space. I can buy and sell from her, and I can use these things myself. The same is true for uh, the arcane enchanter and the alchemy table. You can also acquire scavengers, people who will kind of hang out, and then when the battle's over, they will go and gather up all of the loot off off of your dead enemies and return that loot to you, in, in kind of a as kind of a convenience. Um, I haven't gone that route yet. Um, I was doing a little bit of uh, research and saw there were some people who were having a little bit of trouble with scavengers actually um, taking materials from. Um, from soldiers that actually worked in the fortification, which I would not want. So I didn't opt to go with scavengers yet. I know that Joe is experimenting with it, and I'll be asking him some questions about his experience soon enough, but uh, I may end up doing that in the end. So among other things, um, when the fortification is built, we start to see um, settlers arriving, and, you know, and they'll be looking for for safety, you know, kind of being near the fortification provides them some degree of security, so they will set up there. They will also, you know, come inside and, and you can talk with them. Um, they will pay taxes as well, so nothing's free. You're paying for protection. So let's do a little ride around the perimeter. You can see I've created a palisade here. The palisade is, it's called a wooden wall. I, I purchase it from the um, merchant we saw inside earlier. And what it does is it allows me to build a wall in about 20-foot uh, sections, if you will. So I can drop a palisade section, and then I can drop another one, and I just kind of line them up. And you see here I've kind of overlapped them, and they kind of go around the perimeter of that big platform that I put in place, ending at the rock where the the rock outcropping actually becomes a natural barrier. Now here I'll illustrate, uh, point out one issue I'm having. This is my blacksmith. Somehow during a battle she got outside the walls and she for some reason can't seem to get back to her smithing station. I haven't figured out how to fix that yet. I'm still working on a fix for that, but there she is. Okay, so we can see the perimeter defense. We've got a water source here. This was part of the reason that I selected this, a source of clean drinking water. And then where the rock formation ends, then again we start the palisade defenses. I've put out, you know, another sizable um, platform here and then surrounded it with wooden walls in overlapping sections to kind of get a sense for it. You know, it's not huge. It's not huge, but I'm feeling like it's pretty well defended. Now up on this rock outcrop, I've got a signal fire there, and then I've got soldiers who are manning this watchtower. Those are stationary guards. There are times when, if, if we're attacked, stationary guards will actually come down outside the walls and they'll fight. And uh, there is a mechanism built into the mod that allows them to return to their posts even if, um, you know, even if there's a problem. Obviously, you're building your own thing here. So 
it can't be completely nav meshed. So the workaround there is that they will get, you know, relatively close to their original spot and then they will just kind of vanish and then reappear at that spot because you can't have everything be nav meshed. So a couple of different things. We've we've talked about the soldiers that are that are working the fortification as part of Tundra Defense. These individuals here are actually followers from Amazing Follower Tweaks. Um, I'm using Amazing Follower Tweaks to have them uh, follow me. And because AFT allows me to uh, have followers who can ride uh, horses and so forth, I'm using convenient horses. And essentially, my followers are serving as my cavalry. So all of my followers are on horseback. Um, all of the soldiers from Tundra Defense are infantry. And then I have also dropped a guild starter marker right on top of right on top of the um, the well inside the Emperor's Anvil. And I'm using um, guild starter to kind of create a squad of lightly armored scouts that I send out on little missions. None of them were in there, um, so they're obviously out doing their thing. But essentially what that allows me to do is periodically I can go back to the well, I can visit with my scouts, and I can send them out on missions, which will take them out to either, you know, do good works and and create um, good feelings, I guess, about the Imperial Army in this area, or they can go out and acquire treasure, or mine, or harvest ingredients, um, all kinds of different things. And so then when they come back, I can collect that loot and add it to the coffers. And that, that serves as kind of a constant source of income so that I can continue to build. Um, it doesn't matter really how many raids I do. Um, I'm always going to have a need to uh, have some additional sources of income. So that's essentially it, folks. Again, uh, the mod is Tundra Defense. It is one of the most amazing mods I've, I've ever encountered. Even if you're not interested in building a fortress, you can use it just to build a player home. Kind of, you know, build your own farm. Go out in the middle of nowhere and build a farm and role play that. You know, you can do all of that stuff. And it's, it's quite impressive, easy to use, um, and just super fun to play extraordinary flexibility um, so highly highly recommended well i am going to leave you now um, perhaps now that we're uh on the way out we'll, we'll finish out with a nice bandit raid seems like the right thing to do i'm gonna need a helmet for this So we go to manage raids. Now again, this is something that you can you can set it to to just kind of randomly generate raids. Um, what I've chosen to do is execute raids for now, at least whenever I feel ready. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of different raid types. It can be Draugr, it can be dragons, uh, cultists, animals, giants, vampires, werewolves, Falmer. Um, you name it, you can you can launch a raid. We're going to do a bandit raid, and we'll do a medium difficulty bandit raid. I encourage you to give it a try, folks, and enjoy the adventure. My soldiers are kicking ass. Gotta lick in on him. You can see I'm using the auto collect features. And as my soldiers kill the bad guys, I'm getting prompted to take the loot. And since I'm on horseback, I don't have any weight issues. I'm just taking it all. Got him. 
More loot. Piling up the loot. Wow, look at that scrum. There you go. That's a raid. Now, uh, it gets much more interesting, obviously, if I, if I turn off the auto loot and uh, get off my horse and kind of go on foot. You can increase the size and difficulty of the raids. And if you're looking for an immersive experience, that's definitely the way to go. And then you can use scavengers to actually go out and gather um, all the materials off the bodies afterwards, and they just kind of deliver it right to you. So very, very cool. Um, really awesome. There's a feature also I forgot to mention that allows you to build a mage tower, which um, makes it possible for you to uh, staff up your fortifications with mages, which could be really cool. You could kind of um, create your own guild of mages, so to speak. Wow. Let's just take all of this. See, now I can liquidate this. I can turn this all into gold pieces, which I can use um, to finance additional construction or pay more soldiers. Even better. Even better. So now I'm encumbered. I'm like crazy encumbered. Let's get back on the horse. There you have it, folks. Enjoy the game. Remember, it's not about the objective, it's about the journey, so go forth and experience. <laughs>